Yeah. Uh, friends, good evening. Uh, welcome to Indian Arts Force Kupi Society webinar today evening. Uh, there was a lot of request coming in uh, for an, uh, something uh, which uh, yeah, basic arthroscopy uh, learning should happen. Uh, the only issue was that the webinars which we were doing were less interactive because people had to go on a YouTube channel and chat their uh, queries. When we wanted to start the basic arthroscopy series, uh, we thought Dr. Maheshwari being a senior teacher of arthroscopy and one of the respected members of our society, we should approach him to start with the inaugural lecture of arthroscopy basic topic today. And as usual, Dr. Maheshwari had some brilliant ideas which were out of the box and we are experimenting it for the first time here on Indian Arthroscopy web web webinar. Uh, this is, will be an interactive webinar. We had sent requests some to members to write back if they wanted to be a part of one-to-one -one discussion Indian and face-to-face -face discussion with Dr. Maheshwari. Uh, and uh, we started getting a lot of uh, queries about uh, password and ID. So we have shared it with around 15 people and uh, these people are joining in today. They would be live on face-to-face uh, -face interaction with Dr. Maheshwari. So let me uh, put forward it to Dr. Maheshwari to give a brief how the program is going to run and what are his expectations out of this pro program uh, so that uh, uh, we are able to conduct it uh, this experimental program today in a different and a innovative manner. Dr. Mahesh, right. So maybe I can straight away share my screen and then proceed. Yeah. So uh, I was quite uh, kind of impressed with the way you guys are doing these meetings. And I thought I must put in some bit of my contribution as well. So when IPS suggested that we should have some basic lectures more from the viewpoint of uh, youngsters learning. I can see in the list, they're all experienced arthroscopic surgeons. I mean, I don't think it's going to be any learning for them, but I'm sure with their comments in between, we will build up. So it is going to be interactive in the sense, while I'm talking, it's not a lecture. Anytime you have a point, even the senior people, if you have a point, you can interject and say, okay, this is another way of doing it. So that way we will all interact. We will learn from each other as well as the audience will have all the complete idea and we'll go slow. There is no time limit. If you finish one lecture in one hour, it's okay, but it should be thoroughly done. So let me start with the first one, which is indications of indication for arthroscopy. Uh, so I was, you know, digging my uh, slides. This was a lecture I probably took 20 years back last time. And I was just changing those. And the first slide I realized is there's no longer diagnostic arthroscopy, which we used to do earlier. So arthroscopy is no longer done for diagnosis only. Now diagnosis has to be made clinically or on MRI before you do arthroscopy. It is a treatment modality and hardly ever a diagnostic modality, at least in the knee. So we must have a presumptive diagnosis before we take a patient for arthroscopy. That's first thing. Uh, second is, so, and how do you get to a presumptive diagnosis is by a history, examination, and MRI. Only when all three of these match, the patient deserves going on the operation table. Otherwise, just hold on. And as you know, I will not go into the history of how do you examine the patient, how do you take history. Those are very, very tricky things in themselves. And I used to give a lecture in the past, how do you understand patient's language? Patients talk on local language. Now you don't know what it means because we read all, all our uh, you know, medicine in English, but there's always a local Delhi dialect and Bihar dialect, and they mean different things. So you must understand what your patient is saying. For example, locking for you may be a locked knee, locking for patient may be a certain mechanical disturbance. So sometimes we tend to misunderstand that and our mind starts working in the other direction. So it takes a little while to understand what does it mean when patient says something. Similarly about examination, it takes time to understand how to say one plus, two plus, three plus, how to do different examinations and how to interpret them. Of course, reading MRI, I, I, I would say you have to read your own MRI as orthopedic surgeons and then put three things together to come to a presented diagnosis and then only 
think what you're going to do with this patient. You must have a plan that this is my diagnosis. When I go in, this is what I will do. And most likely I'll find A. Very often you'll find B. I have a plan for B also. Because as you know, these are keyhole surgery. In open surgery, you can use the osteotome. You can use a chisel in place of osteotome if osteotome is not there. That doesn't happen in arthroscopic surgery. If a diagnosis is A, you need a set of tools, a set of skills. If diagnosis is B and you're not prepared, for example, you have gone for menis meniscus surgery and on the table you find ACL is torn. If you're not prepared, you can't do it. So you have to have a plan A, B, C, depending on what you find on your presented diagnosis. So I always think like this. What am I likely to find and what am I going to do? I should have this. You can say in simple language, prognosis, you know, uh, presumptive diagnosis and plan, but I, my question is in simple language, what am I likely to find in this patient and what am I going to do? I should be almost 90% correct. 10% scope for surprises is always there. And you should be prepared for surprises. Okay, if in case it happens that way, what I'm going to do? There is absolutely no scope of any surgery based on only MRI. Very often I get an MRI on WhatsApp and they say, what is to be done? It shows this, that. I think 50% times my approach changes when I examine the patient and take history. So just an MRI is very often wrongly reported, number one. The interpretation has to be made. And how does that lesion affect the patient is the most important consideration. And that's why just on MRI, no surgery. Now, patients are naturally attracted to arthroscopy because it's a keyhole surgery. They are more or less, you know, asking for arthroscopy. So one of my contraindication of doing arthroscopy is when a patient says on phone, doctor, I arthroscopy karani hai. And automatically, I know this patient, I'm not going to do arthroscopy. Why? Because this is a guy who had some problem in his knee. MRI showed something. He was advised arthroscopy and he has very high hopes. Hardly any patient quickly agrees for surgery. If he's agreeing for surgery, that means his hopes are very high and I better be sure that I'm not going to disappoint him. So such a patient is more or less a contraindication for me to do surgery because he has very high hopes. And I know more often than not, these are all grade three, grade four osteoarthritis where they are going around with pain and somebody does an MRI and he says, you have a meniscus tear. And now they are quickly jumping for arthroscopy. So my message is, Whenever a patient is almost asking for arthroscopy, he is underestimating the beneficial potential and also he is taking it easy. But if you touch such a patient and he doesn't improve because his expectations are high, he becomes your baby and he rooms around all over talking how bad a doctor you are and you did the surgery and nothing happened. So now issue with keyhole surgery is as seeing itself is tricky. As you know, when you open up, in open surgery, you can open a little more, open, put a retractor, you can adjust your light. But when you're seeing through a keyhole, the seeing itself is tricky. You can't see things properly because you have to get used to seeing a part of the problem and then imagine the rest of it. Now you see a limited area and interpretation of what you're seeing. For example, very often you see, is it actually a meniscus tear or is it something, you know, some blood clot sitting there giving that kind of appearance. So, Seeing itself is tricky because it's a keyhole surgery. Then you're seeing a limited area. Rest of it you have to imagine beyond left, right, what must be there. And you have to see that also. And then interpret, particularly in relation to the patient's symptoms, whether what you're seeing is actually the reason for patient's problem. And this is how the, your mind should keep working when you're doing arthroscopy. Coming to indications, these are more or less book indications. And I have put them as gold and silver. Gold is the one where I will go for gold. If I have that patient, I will almost catch him. I will almost, you know, uh, kind of catch him and take him to the OT if I like, because I know those are the cases which will give me a good result. I don't want to let go of that patient. Even if I have to do for free, I have a patient who will talk good about me, get me more patients. On the other end, there's a silver indication where you're doubtful. So you have to take your time. So let me come to gold indications first. For example, a loose body. A patient say, I have a loose body in my knee. He can put his finger, he can show you. You can see on the x-ray. That's a juicy indication. 
just go in, remove the loose body, and the job is done. Of course, there are a lot of nuances about loose body, big, small, one, two. It can be very kind of taxing sometimes, but a typical medium-sized loose body, patient can feel it. You can see it on the x-ray. Go ahead, hit it. This is the best case to give the best results. Then sometimes mechanical symptoms, suggestive of meniscus tear, mechanical, not pain. For example, patients, I get locking and locking. And you realize that this is probably related to meniscus and that is confirmed on the MRI. Yes, I think that's a good case. At least locking and locking will disappear. Sometimes similarly, some jerks because of unstable meniscus and if that can correlate with your MRI findings. So mechanical symptoms are good to be relieved by arthroscopy. If it is pain, very often, no. So these are the mechanical symptoms. But if the patient has pain, even with meniscus tear, if there is no men uh, mechanical symptoms, and you do arthroscopy just for pain in a simple meniscus tear, sometimes they don't do better. So you have to be sure that there is something that you can cure in that patient. So mechanical symptom, go for it. Pain, majorly, not much mechanical symptom, plus minus. Similarly, other goal indications are if your patient has a cyanovitis, today you can do very good cyanovectomy. You can remove quite a bit of it and patient is relieved. Osteochondritis, visible on MRI, a loose body, a flap there causing persistent cyanovitis. Go in, just shave it off. It works very well. Septic knee can be very well managed with arthroscopy. So these are indications. If you have that kind of a patient, jump on it. There's no thinking required. As you grow, <clears throat> better and better. You can take up cases which are more difficult, arthrolysis, more or less a magic uh, treatment and a magic surgery for a stiff knee is arthroscopic surgery. If you can make the right diagnosis, patients are so obliged because almost no surgery and you've got their knee to bending. <clears throat> Further on, if you learn more, ligament reconstruction, arth even arthrodesis arthroscopic and even prior to STO. Now, these are indications where you do arthroscopy. It serves some distinct purpose. Patient can realize the difference. He can feel the difference. And then I come to silver indications where I'm not sure what the patient has. I give my own time, try all non-invasive non diagnostic modalities, wait, do conservative treatment, and more or less, patient should more or less be begging for surgery. And then I say, okay, I will do a diagnostic arthroscopy and decide what is to be done. I don't know what's happening in your knee. So these are cases where we will not jump to surgery very easily, even if the patient is asking for it, but give your time, because these are the patients where half of them at least will be dissatisfied. Because you don't know what's happening, you find something else inside, and you know at the end of the case, you know whatever you have done will not, is not going to work. So you have a dissatisfied patient moving around. So these are cases where I'm a little more careful, cautious, give them enough time, do whatever test possible, do one MRI after some time, do another MRI, do conservative treatment and wait and wait and wait. And a stage comes when patients say, okay, I'm fed up, arthroscopy. And some of these cases are anterior knee pain, femoral malalignment, degenerative joint disease, even osteoarthritis. Sometimes patients get fed up and you don't find much in terms of x-rays and the sudden deterioration, you find surprise findings like a root tear or like a uh, meniscus tear, especially if they have mechanical symptoms. If it is a huge synovitis, sometimes patient is fed up, you can do arthroscopy, more of a lavage benefit. So all these reads, wait and watch and counseling. But these are very likely dissatisfied patient if you jump to arthroscopy too quickly. So that's what I mean to say. They are not the ones where you jump too quickly, give them time so that they understand that you have limitations and you can have them the result that they want. Similarly, other silver indications are non-specific monoarthritis where you want a diagnosis, more or less a biopsy thing, and sometimes vague mechanical symptoms when you've done enough conservative treatment and you think one of these things may be found inside and very likely this patient may benefit. So these all silver indications are may benefit type where I repeat, give it enough time, do test once, maybe twice, uh, sometime even MRI over a period of three, four months, you can repeat. Patients are very happy paying for uh, tests and it can always give you some idea about whether things are progressing and you should enter. Otherwise, just hold on.
so those are the way i decide my gold indication where i jump for surgery i don't want the patient to leave my clinic on the other end i have silver patient where even if they are asking for surgery i take my time and i don't jump there because i know quite a few of them are going to be dissatisfied uh sometimes even after tkr when you have patients coming all the time again and again and again there's some click some pain and i blend up doing arthroscopy because it's a keyhole surgery easy to convince the patient and more often than not even if the patient is not benefited it acts as a placebo because i tell them okay everything is fine inside your x ray is fine and somehow they just you know sit back again a counseling issue to just if i if we can cure clicks very good if you cannot at least you are sure nothing is wrong and patient somehow takes it easy and relaxes similarly persistent symptom after any other knee, knee operation where you are not sure what's happening at some stage you give the patient the option regarded prognosis and do surgery these two indications are more or less placebo effect to the patient where after having tried everything when they are not doing well and you tell them we'll see and if we find something we'll cure you and at the end of the operation you tell them okay we found nothing it was all fine somehow they settle down somehow they don't then shop around here and there and you know start talking about left and right so in particularly in knee hem arthroscopy a lot of people ask me should you do arthroscopy so in my practice these are the two indications if you have a clear cut osteochondral loose body which may be coming from a patella acute hem arthrosis you do a arthroscopy and sometimes in professional athletes because their anxiety factor is so much that they want to know exactly what is wrong with their knee and sometime even on examination mri you cannot say and you can do diagnostic arthroscopy just to tell them this is the extent of your problem and this is the extent of requirement of your rehab or no restriction or whatever so it's again more or less uh, related to their anxiety level and their concerns and arthroscopy is a minimally invasive you can always do it in osteoarthritis my this this used to be a four list yesterday i trained with two mechanical symptoms and generally as a pre op test to decide definitive surgery and that's one reason i do osteoarthritis arthroscopy in osteoarthritis very often to decide between for example a uni compartment versus a uh, total knee so very often the patient is young it looks like uni compartment on x rays and i want to do uni compartment but obviously patient has had lot of opinions about tkr and if i jump the gun and do a uni and he has a problem tomorrow i better be sure so these cases if they are not candidates for tkr yet and they are only you know hedging between doing nothing and doing a ukr then before i cut them open and see okay other compartments are also involved that be very embarrassing so i do a pre op arthroscopy to convince myself number one and to have a recording so that tomorrow if anything is not okay with their you know follow up and the result wise at least i am quite convinced that i did the right job because i had a pre op arthroscopy done which showed that this was a dedicated medial compartment arthritis so these are some of the reasons why in you know in when you are practicing medicine there are some reasons which are more uh, practice oriented rather than uh, academic i would say but then that's the way it should be now some contraindication for arthroscopy uh if there is a septic focus everybody knows no and too important a very minor problem where you wait and watch it's too minor whatever mri may say patient has not much problem it is better to just shoo him away tell him physiotherapy will work just wait 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 and sometimes you are inexperienced and you have no backup so if you are inexperienced you must understand which kind of arthroscopies will you will do and don't jump because problem with arthroscopy is if it doesn't work out you can't open up unless you have counseled the patient and if you open up the knee and try to do something that you had promised him that you will do it arthroscopic that becomes a little setback for the patient if you have not done the pre operative counseling so only if you have a backup plan and for everything that may turn out to be when you do arthroscopy then do it otherwise you limit yourself to what you are good at slowly but we have all progressed very very slowly and over a period of time we gain confidence and do more and more complicated surgery so particularly for beginners you must know what is your level of experience and then only do the surgery otherwise you'll get mess up get stuck patient is unhappy surgery has happened you can't open up because you have not consulted so i think that's another 
reason why you should shy away from doing arthroscopy. Uh, I think that is the end, but there was no interaction. We can interact now. Hello? Yes, sir. Oh? We, we had actually muted. So, so I think uh, let us put two questions. If anybody has a question, you can ask a question. Anybody right has any, any, any more good indication for doing arthroscopy? Yeah. Uh, participants can unmute themselves and uh, have I missed something? Yeah, so Tanme, unmute you can unmute Tanme, Ranjit, maybe. Yeah, Dr. Tirth, huh. yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, uh, so uh. Thank you for uh, lovely uh, in the lecture and the indication uh, that is gold and silver indication that is new concept for me. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask uh, how to take a posterior lateral uh, portal, like safe method for posterior taking a posterior lateral portal. Mm -hmm. So since this was basic, I did not particularly, maybe I'll come to the technique and we can talk then, but I can tell you. So I make a posterior medial portal first, which I make under vision, you know, with a needle. And once I've made a posterior medial portal, I take my switching stick. So my knee, shoulders, knee surgery, arthroscopy set has borrowed some instruments from shoulder surgery. Sure. And, and that makes it happy. So what I do is I take a switching stick and I go transseptal touching the posterior condyles of femur. You know, you can touch and you can see you go trans uh, behind the condyles and with the knee flex to 90 degree, go on the other side, which is like inside out technique of making a portal, which is very safe. So you make posterior medial portal under vision. From there, take a switching stick, go along the posterior, uh, you know, flare of the condyles and go to the other side, poke the skin, make a small cut, put a cannula there. That's what I do. Okay. Anybody Thank does you. it differently? Uh, sir, uh, I want to ask something, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the same method. Now, when we have taken posterior medial portal, and as you said, uh, under region, you take posterior medial, then pass a switching stick from medial to lateral, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do we visualize the switching stick when it is passing behind the femoral condyle or tibial no, condyle? No, 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 you cannot because there is a septum there. Okay. You cannot. But if you can see, of course, the direction of the needle cannot be posteriorly. That much we understand. The direction has to be from medial to lateral. Yeah. And you can go by feel, you can feel the condyle. So you have to more or less perforate the septum, which you can do blindly, no problem. So you can feel the tip of the switching stick going, skirting against the posterior condyles, which is safe. I mean, there's no problem. As long as you're not going posteriorly, that will be foolish. But even then, if you go from medial to lateral, you have to be really almost 45 degree oblique to enter the posterior part of the knee where the vessels are. That's very, very, very unlikely. So if you know the direction from medial to lateral you're going and you're skirting against the posterior fair of the condyles, the switching stick pokes on the lateral side, your knees flex, which means your nerve is far away. And then you make a kick, a nick there and put a cannula on top of it. I have been doing this for many years and I think it is safe. But how often do you need a posterior lateral portal in your practice? Posterior medial is more commonly needed. Yeah, so whenever, uh, like whenever I do something at the back of the knee, particularly some tumor at the back, some loose bodies at the back, and even PCL reconstruction. So we do transeptal PCL reconstruction where we remove the septum and then, you know, everything is visible. So you can see from one and you can work from behind the posterior release of the capsule from the tibia. So I think over the over a period of time, transeptal approach to the posterior compartment of the knee has become very, very, very popular with me, very easy. As soon as you remove the septum, the whole thing blows up. You can see both the condyles backside as well as the PCL all the PCL avulsion fixation, and a lot of time you have loose bodies at the back of the knee, synovitis, chondromatosis, and you know, uh, sometimes even PCL ganglion, which you cannot approach from the front. 
and you can see on the MRI that everything is more at the back of the knee. And mm -hmm. from front to back, you may have to damage a lot of things. So I do quite often actually transeptal approach. Sir, question has come. Do you put Sir. a cannula on the posterior medial portal or you uh, just yes. make a cab yes. and you always a cannula? It's better. The posterior medial, posterior portal, uh, posterior lateral, always cannula because as you know, those are areas where you don't want to enter again and again. Okay. Yeah, I think sir. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, a synovectomy is a very basic procedure in uh, uh, knee arthroscopy. So, yeah. what is your extent of the synovectomy? Uh, what are the parts you remove from medial lateral gutter, uh, uh, suprapatellar pouch uh, behind the knee? As you told, the posterolateral and posteromedial portal you uh, require for synovectomy, back of the knee. So yeah. how often you have to go to back of the knee for the synovectomy and what are the indications of that type of synovectomy? Okay. So uh, earlier in my practice, say 10 years back or maybe 15 years back, I used to do only anterior synovectomy and used to kind of skip posterior, posterior synovectomy. Now I do an MRI and very often there is a significant synovitis at the back of the knee. So I do not do all the time, but I would say almost 50% times there is a huge synovitis even at the back of the knee where I have to do what is called six portal synovectomy. And what I do there is I just go enterolateral, enteromedial, the usual arthroscopy diagnostic. And first I finish the posterior compartment because once I do superolateral, superomedial, then the water flow goes haywire and you know the distension is not there. So first I clear up the area behind the both the Menis uh, both the, the ligaments, uh, cruciate ligaments, enter the posterior medial compartment, make my posterior medial portal, and then make my posterior lateral portal as I told you. Then first I finish the back of the knee with the help of a you know seeing from one side and doing uh, from the other side, and then I exchange. So first see from the medial side and bring your shaver from the posterior lateral, then shift your you know scope to the posterior lateral come to posterior medial and that way you remove almost all synovium at the back of the knee and sometimes it is visible on MRI, it's quite a bit, you cannot leave it. Then after doing this, because I have cannula there and cannula do not allow uh, you know, water to flow out, they're all with the stoppers and then I come to my standard synovectomy which is then, you know, you go from enterolateral, enteromedial, go into the notch, go into the gutters, medial lateral gutters, go to suprapetular pouch then move to superolateral portal and then work in the superolateral and again in the gutter on the superior side. So now using four portal, you cover the whole knee. Like both the gutters nicely, you have to you have to make four portals if you want to do a good anterior synovectomy. Otherwise, things get left out here and there in the corner. And very often I have seen that I thought I've done enough. And then I look at from the superolateral portal and I find there's a big ch chunk of a synovitis enterolateral part just under my you know telescope mm. so uh, the, this is the way i proceed for doing a complete synovectomy so two posterior and four anterior portals sir yes okay yashiti ji yes. yeah so uh, uh, after fixation of a say a distal femur fracture or an upper tibia fracture and a patient landing with stiffness how commonly do you use arthroscopy for relieving the patient for uh, of the stiffness and do you get an MRI done? Uh, the basic indication is some intra-articular adhesions or uh, you just decide clinically that uh, whether the patient is going to get relief after arthroscopy. Okay, so uh, post-trauma, whenever there is a stiff knee, first consideration is whether the fracture is healed. Because I know whatever I will do, I will manipulate that knee on the table and I don't want the fracture to happen. So that's first thing. I must have a good x-ray to ensure that the fracture is healed. If it is not healed, I will wait. Six months, one year, doesn't matter. Till the fracture is very solid, I would not do any mobilization. Second thing. Second thing is then I realize what is the reason for stiffness. For example, very often the stiffness is because of malunion. There is some bone piece or you know subluxation of the knee posteriorly, which is causing block to extension or causing block to function, uh, for example, a, a Hoffa's fracture. So if there's no bony reason, there is no bone looks normal, sometimes you may need a CT scan to see that the bony structure is normal, 
then you know everything is soft tissue. Soft tissue means it can be intraarticular, it can be extraarticular. Extraarticular more so in low supracondylar fractures, where half of the stiffness is usually outside the joint. Intraarticular not much. So there are two types of knee stiffness I see after trauma. One is where surgery has been done, where the incision is in front of the knee. So wherever there is an incision in front of the knee, that's a gold case for arthrolysis for me. Gold case means jump on it. Jump. Because I know the stiffness is going to be just behind that scar. Rest of the joint is going to be normal. You just go where the scar is, just work under the scar and you'll find that part of the capsule is actually attached to the suprapatella pouch. And you release it very, very gratifying, very quick release cases. Wherever there is no scar, that means that stiffness is actually coming from suprapatellar area. Those are tricky cases. Because then you have to, sometime doing intraarticular release, you have to go all the way in the suprapatellar pouch. That means you have to look at from a superolateral portal and even take sometime a long osteotome to go almost to the distal one third of femur. Release everything from the femur slowly in a kind of a, you know, release the quadriceps from the femur. And then only you can get. Those are difficult cases. One has to plan on a lateral x-ray. If there's a lot of bone forming there, sometimes you may have to actually excise the bone arthroscopically with the help of chisel. So you have to, the flat, the anterior surface of the femur has to be flat. flat. If it is not flat and you release it, there'll be adhesion again. So that's yeah. the way I proceed for a stiff knee post-trauma. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sir, 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 sir. Uh, Ranjit, yes. Yeah. Sir, since we are uh, discussing the basics and we have started from the basics, yeah. now the young surgeons uh, who have just uh, seen a uh, few cases in their residency and after passing out, uh, they have uh, attended some cadaveric courses and one or two observership for one or two weeks and they have procured the basic uh, instrument sets. Now they want to start the arthroscopy. Now, what are your advice of uh, selection of cases? Because many of them, uh, they'll end up with taking up a, a osteoarthritic knee and uh, they are not able to do anything. And uh, then the second case, they are very reluctant to take up. And there is a fear factor to get into the scopy field. So hmm. what are uh, your advice to them and so, how they so, should proceed? Right, very good question. And I can tell them, I can go back 35 years back when I started doing arthroscopy myself. And we had no courses. We have almost no books. We had no nothing. It was all doing and learning. And yeah. I used to get very frustrated thinking that why can't I do it? Why can't I see it? And one day I sat down and thought to myself, what is wrong with me? Why can't I do arthroscopy? I remember there was a day when there were 4,000 people in the world. Now they must be in millions maybe doing arthroscopy. But that time there were 4,000 doctors in the world doing arthroscopy and arthroscopic surgery. And that particular day I asked myself, what is the difference between me and these 4,000? I'm an intelligent guy, maybe better than them. So what is missing? And then I told myself, if you can't learn, how about the first surgeon who did arthroscopy? Who taught him? Who taught him arthroscopy? He did it himself. So I'm at least better than them. There are some books, some literature, some video. So, you know, you have to understand that there are people, pioneers, who did it the first time. And they were also human beings. Now you are much better. So first thing is you must tell yourself, you are intelligent, you will learn. Have patience. Second, second is always start doing cases where you can, if required, you do arthroscopy, play with the arthroscopy for some time, half an hour, and then do open and finish the job. A lot of our patients are poor. They don't mind. If you tell them you will be fixed, I will remove your loose body by open surgery. They don't mind. They want loose body removed. Now you are a new arthroscopic surgeon. That's an opportunity not to remove it by open surgery. Play with arthroscopy for some time. For example, biopsy. Biopsy of the knee. You can do. Anybody can do very easily. But that's a time you enter the joint. Just play around with it. Take a biopsy. Do some triangulation. And you know at the end of it, you will not disappoint the patient because you can do a small incision and take a biopsy still. So choose cases where you can back up with your present skills in case you fail. You will fail, but you cannot afford to fail because patient wants results. So choose only those cases. For example, osteoarthritis. 
lot of patient cannot afford to take care they cannot do anything their pain their selling you counsel them that you will do arthroscopy for some time they'll be better it's a matter of counseling i would i would say don't do arthroscopy in osteoarthritis but there are patients where you have no other option they have some loose bodies they have some synovitis now there those are the kind of cases where you can do arthroscopy if you have counseled them well for example i would say even do free to them if you have that kind of a case which is teaching you and you know you may not be benefited and if you do it free of cost he is not going to tell you anything he is only telling you going to tell you thank you very much but in the bargain you have learned so i think these are some tricks which we did when we were learning arthroscopy ourselves so if there is a gold indication just even if the patient cannot pay just admit him and do it because he is paying you by teaching you by making you learn that technique so sometimes we have to be very smart that some cases i will do in spite of the fact if i don't get paid for it because i'm learning all right so i think these are the few tricks yes. you have to use and get into the wherever there is a possibility before the knee surgery put a scope inside okay put a scope inside even in hematosis just play with it wash it out and you know see your instruments together another half an hour but that will make you better for the next arthroscopy and next arthroscopy so i always say whenever if you have time and obviously most people have time enough so whenever you doing any knee surgery tell yourself i will play with arthroscopy for half an hour before i do designated knee surgery which i was supposed to do this is like you know experimenting a little bit and then you gain confidence uh, sir we have a question from dr tejas and then dr shitij so dr Shitej tejas Sony. yeah sir yeah. my my question is about stiffness after arthroscopy like uh, after acl reconstruction or uh, meniscectomies or meniscus repair uh, we discussed uh, stiff how to relieve the stiffness of post traumatic but uh, what about ar- after the arthroscopy how can we uh, manage the stiffness after arthroscopy surgery so serious stiffness should not happen after these operation uncommon unless your your rehab is little bit slow and patient is not cooperative or some low grade infection happens or synovitis happens which is going on and you are kind of going slow because of pain patient cannot move so i think the more important if you are doing meniscus surgery and acl surgery more important to pick up upcoming stiffness at the right time you cannot wait for the stiffness to happen these patients more often than not because people immobilize them for long patient doesn't do physiotherapy he's not in the proper follow up and they develop stiffness so i act whenever i find a patient is not and we have a gold sheet which we give to the patient that your knee must move 90 degree in 2 weeks if it is not moving 90 degree they're not following the goal they better give, raise the alarm and if they raise the alarm my physiotherapist know that this knee is not moving why is it not moving what has gone wrong so sometimes for example you aspirate the knee if there is a sign of arthritis patient has pain is not bending so i would say prevention is more important you never let them go for example a lot of patient develop a 5 10 degree of flexion deformity and they escape your eye because physiotherapists are more concentrate concentrating on getting the range of motion and they miss out on 5 10 degree of flexion deformity which is very horrible it doesn't get cured after 4 6 weeks and then you do passive manipulation it's very difficult so i catch them if there is any tendency for flexion deformity i even put them in a brace what we call push knee splint and i tell the physiotherapist don't bother about the range of motion it will come but i want the knee straight so i think in post surgical cases more important is to catch them early before they actually become stiff so most of the patient i see stiffness after surgeries actually from outside and there for various reasons maybe infection maybe persistent synovitis or sometime even immobilization but otherwise normally it should not happen if you are very watchful about post operative rehabilitation if it happens obviously you have to go in and do exactly the way you will do for any other stiff knee go in remove adhesions mobilize it maybe manipulate a little bit things like that sir is there role of a night splint or a slab uh, do you put it in some cases which have got a tendency to keep the knee bent in post operative phase so you see a patient in 24 hour next day morning and he is keeping it bent so do you advise him a night yeah, for, slab for, for for about a week i am not very aggressive because mm-hmm. patients have pain and i know no adhesions are going to happen within a week but from one week onwards i insist that patient keeps it straight 
after two weeks if there is still a flexion contracture or deformity i jump on to bracing yeah. and not the standard long knee brace they are in flexion already and they actually keep the knee in flexion but i use what is called a push knee splint which pushes the patella backward this is to regain extension and i tell the patient use it maybe three four times a day one two hours you walk with this and with those concerted effort of stretching them keeping them straight in about two three weeks time they stretch out yeah dr soni sir so, so, so. i have a question i want to ask how do you tackle patella fat pad because initially in initial cases cases it is very difficult to go through it yeah so maybe we can we are coming to the technique so we do so have my, a, next next talk we'll talk about this and we will discuss the technical issue so, how do you handle when you are doing arthroscopy you get problems as you are saying fat pad so we will maybe come there yeah so tell me you have a question so maybe indications and uh if something i missed about indication how do you decide for example mri reports they are usually not very very satisfactory so combination of history and most important at the end of doing history examination and mri i ask myself why is this patient there what is his problem actually lot of patients come to me because it is acl written in the report and they have read on the you know on the net what it means and i will develop this i will develop that actually they have no problem so sometimes you examine everything is fine patient has a good lacman and you know there is no swelling there is a little bit of a pain but acl is visible as torn on mri so after doing everything that case is not a acl tear case for me that is just anxiety created out of mri i don't touch that patient then so i think at the end of clinical evaluation you have to find out what exactly is bothering this patient and will my surgery fix his problem for example if he is very anxious about something even if i do surgery i'm not going to fix his problem the problem is anxiety Uh, Dr. Teet. Yeah, sir. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask regarding ACL reconstruction. Uh, I am using uh, endo button on the femoral side. So, uh, what to do if it gets flipped on the uh, IT band, or and how to prevent such flipping? Uh, maybe. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I can answer the question, but uh, since this is a basic thing, maybe we'll have something like this on ACL. and then yes. we'll talk about all the problems of acl yeah is that okay, okay. yeah because so, I, because yes. i know a lot of listeners may be very very basic and they might find that ye to pata nahi apni upar ki kya kya baatein kar rahe hain you know sometimes i find in conferences all the faculty start discussing amongst themselves and all the people sitting 80% of them feel i don't know what they are talking so we will just understand that the audience if they, that is their level that's what we should concentrate on so maybe uh anybody wants to talk about more indications how do they we'll come to basic arthroscopic technique also maybe that can be covered there i don't think so sir all, all the questions have been answered by you uh, so sir, i have to... one question yeah okay yeah, yeah. Uh, sir regarding uh, like what are the tips and tricks for removal of the loose uh, bodies uh okay so loose bodies uh, i have some basic uh, fundamentals one is whenever there is a loose body you should be able to see it on x ray okay then that loose body is your friend you can remove it if you can't see it on x ray something is happening then there is a lot of pseudo loose bodies which are loose bodies for patient which are loose body for mri guy or x ray guy not for you fibula for example right third is whenever there is a loose body if it is a medium and large size i'm very comfortable i know this is a cake walk you can remove it even large size you can maybe make make it in pieces but you can remove it whenever you have a loose body less than 1 cm or even something like that 1 cm and around those are the most tricky ones and you must do an x ray almost just before the patient is under anesthesia almost just so if you see a x ray after 5 days earlier the loose body was in front of the knee and in 5 days it has gone to the back of the knee now what you are doing is you are searching for it in front of the knee you never find it and maybe you are not that experienced about going to the back of the knee so you must have a x ray very recent if not this morning at least one day before and my fourth principle is whenever there is one loose body 
there is one more so don't get happy when you remove a loose body and you take a deep breath and you want to come out of the operation theater because you've got the loose body i have made this mistake at least two three times in last so many years but there were two loose bodies one was causing problem one was visible to me i removed the one which is visible to me on the x ray and i was very happy and then the patient comes after week 10 days and says i still have a loose body sensation and actually there was another one so whenever one loose body has come out wait scan the joint go to the postero medial postero lateral from the front of the knee try behind the medial condyle behind the lateral condyle you know behind the popliteus be very thorough that you may not be losing another loose body particularly so when patients have localized chondromatosis or osteochondral loose body sometimes there are more than one there are one two three and you remove one and you are feeling happy and you are caught because there is another one there so i think these are the three four things i understand when i have a loose body patient and very often i tell my chalo loose body nikal lo but i am around i know this small loose body may decide to go anywhere while he's trying to catch it it just slips at the back of the knee and it was visible 5 minutes back now it is not visible because there slips at the back of the knee and now at that stage he may not be very trained to go at the back of the knee so i have to come kind of come in so loose body is a little bit tricky but large loose body no problem if you if you can't remove it mini open little bit put your finger in take it out suprapetal pouch medium size loose body is very easy to remove you will almost find it almost catch it nicely remove it but anything around 1 cm and smaller is tricky one they float here and there like a mouse second there always one or two sometimes osteochondral particularly and if they go to the back of the knee and you have not done the x ray in the morning you are looking for loose body in suprapetal pouch where it was you know in the x ray one week back then you will be you know struggling and you will not even think at that time where is the loose body gone and actually it is gone and be prepared to take a intraoperative image intensifier if it is a bony loose body and if you are not finding it that's another trick so i think these are the basic issues with loose body and uh, arthroscopy thank you sir uh, sir uh, we have a question from dr amol amol dhavle sir good evening i wanted to ask regarding the uh, sterilization of various arthroscopy uh, equipments like scope the shaver and uh, the small instruments because uh, some people do in, it in sidex some do it uh, autoclave and some do in um, etude so which would be the best for the patient so best for the patient is plasma sterilization but everybody doesn't have it so forget it so i think uh, practically speaking it is between sidex and still a lot of people use formalin i have used formalin for almost 10 years and uh, though today if i say formalin everybody will kill me but i know practically our country is our country a lot of people just have to use things which may not be correct but practically it speaking they travel from a place to b place what do they do they can't you know sterilization is not possible everywhere so as far as possible the delicate instruments i put them overnight in sidex and these days you have a quick sidex if you are doing too many cases then for half an hour in between in the quick quick whatever sidex i don't know the name of the chemical but within half an hour it sterilizes so my scope my light cable and my you know shaver tips i want to reuse reuse them in between sidex otherwise they are all uh, etiod all the plastic things cannulas everything are etiod and all the arthroscopy set including cutters everything is autoclaved all metal stuff is autoclaved even in between the cases all plastic stuff in between the cases sidex but otherwise etiod and all my scope and you know light cable which is more delicate though they are autoclavable but i can't trust my you know autoclave team and handling and this and that and these are delicate instrument in i mean i i would like to just be careful and i use sidex uh, that is safe and maybe it works it also works but if you want me what is the current it is plasma sterilization not possible everywhere sir so how will you address yeah. the scores in sidex scores yeah. so you you sir. change very frequently i know sidex is not the best because some of the spores may not be killed 
But if you look at practicality and widely availability, I think Sidex is the best. You have to take care of your Sidex. It should be used for your instrument and not everybody, you know, proctoscope and everything. All the, uh, you know, gastroenterologists, they put all their instruments there and they're doing all kinds of surgery. So it has to be a arthroscopy Sidex tray and not a general instrument where everybody is putting. And you have to be, your team has to know that they have to change it frequently. This is a safe vest. Though theoretically, still Sidex is not the best, but I think practically it is quite safe and I, I do it like that. And sir, cover for the camera, co camera cover, sir, for camera? So again, I think I, I use camera cover for all arthroscopies and because uh, I don't just depend on the, uh, a lot of people use, uh, uh, put their uh, cameras in Sidex or even they sterilize it by ETO, but I'm maybe I'm used to using it with camera, I use it with camera. Sometimes there's a fogging issue, particularly in shoulder arthroscopy, which uh, if I do in sitting position, it is there. In lying down position, it's not there. Otherwise, not a problem. And I, maybe I've got used to using uh, camera and I use it. It keeps my instrument. More important is it keeps your camera safe. These are all very expensive stuff. And sometimes I don't want to subject myself to the you know, anxiety of spoiling them by giving it to so many people. Unless your team is tuned and the hospital is very, very perfect in everything and, um, and and you trust people. I mean, I'm in Max Hospital, which is one of the best in Delhi, but it's still, you know, sometimes you give it to people and they can just mess up with it. So I'm a little bit uh, kind of, you can say, paranoid about not losing my, spoiling my instruments. How you avoid fogging, sir, of your camera? Yeah, so first is you have to clean it nicely, seal it, so tighten and then seal it with a tape also on top of it. Still, sometimes fogging happens, particularly in shoulder arthroscopy. And uh, earlier, I used to open the thing and redrape everything. But these days, one of my some assistant told me a trick that I make a small nick and put a suction tube in the camera. So there's another parallel suction tube going, and that takes away all the moisture. Yeah. So that works very well. If fogging happens, just make a small nick, put a suction tube, tighten it with some kind of a tape, you know, all these yellow tapes. And if you use the suction, the fogging goes away. Yeah. That's a clever clip. So, sir, we can go to the next part of the presentation. Yeah. So, now I will go to the next one, which is... Uh, stop at the share window is closed, right? Yeah, you need to share again. Sir. Yeah. So, where is it gone? Your presentation would be the way I unshared it, sir. Why am I you getting... open your presentation first, sir, and then share. Yeah, it was open. So it must be down. No, it's, I can't see it down. Anyway, I'll open it. You can it minimize it. Maybe put an, uh, press the escape button. File and recent. A recent file that will be open indications and then diagnostic round. Yeah, and then you can share this link. Is it visible now? Not yet, share. but yeah. Not share. Yeah, now it's visible, sir. Okay. Yeah. Right. So let me go here. So a little bit about uh, for very, very beginning doctors, diagnostic round. How do I do diagnostic? First is, I think you are in arthroscopy, you are always in the mode of making a diagnosis first. In almost 50% of the cases, it is always doubtful. Clinical examination, history, MRI, one, two, repeated examination, is still the suspense is there when you put your scope in. So I think examination and anesthesia is one very big opportunity to do in a case where everything is not 100% sure. And it will definitely give you. Because there's an opportunity to compare the both sides. You have a lot of time with you. Patient is relaxed. So EUA is a very important, uh, you know, a milestone for adding to your diagnostic ability before you even put the scope. For example, I remember once I was thinking this is a ACL case and I was prepared for ACL. And when I did uh, examination and anesthesia, it looked like PCL. Now I could examine it properly because patient was relaxed. I could compare from the other side. Not only that, I could take two stress x-rays on the table under image intensifier to tell my patient how I change my diagnosis. Otherwise, you find it very embarrassing to convince the patient that 
you're such a stupid doctor you don't even know that there was a pcl tear and you went in and tell him later it was a pcl tear and obviously to do pcl you have to be mentally prepared you have to go differently different instrument so eua gives you that last opportunity before you put your knife on the patient there is still an opportunity if you find something hanky panky get the patient out of anesthesia sorry it, i can't do it it cannot work but once you put your knife on the patient then is your baby so i think i insist that eua is a very important golden opportunity for two reasons one the patient is under anesthesia is relaxed second both the limbs are available for comparison which are not very often available in the clinic because wo pant utari nahi thoda upar chada li thoda ye kar liya but you know but here it is exposed completely third you have a possibility of taking an x ray particularly a stress x ray which is very difficult to do in a normal practice go to the x ray department do it it's a lot of headache so you can do a x ray if you are doubtful about anterior posterior medial opening lateral opening very often in clinical exam it looks like a mcl opening and then you go on the table and you see it is mcl and you do the other side even that looks mcl opening which means the patient is lax and then you are still not sure you do x rays of both sides with equal pressure and you realize it's opening on both the sides and then you are convinced this is probably the patient's ligaments are lax it's not a mcl tear so that way eua can help and then comes which portals do you make how and this is a very standard you know very basic uh, talk on where do you pick portal for people who are very very basic i'll quickly go over it and trolateral is our workhorse and normally you have a soft spot here and you put your incision in the middle of the soft spot if you don't know what you are doing if it is a diagnostic arthroscopy or even if it is meniscectomy now this very portal the first portal sometimes you change depending on what you are going to do inside for example if it is a acl case people who do acl reconstruction so then you don't make this portal here you rather go somewhere there as close to the lower bottle of the petal and as lateral as possible there in this spot so they can see the lateral wall very well from there you can't see it if you are too much away similarly if you are working on say uh, uh, you know the, the uh, lateral meniscus for example sometimes you change your portal or you are working on the petla so you go actually a little more low if you go and make a portal here and you want to work on the petla it will be very difficult you will not be able to see so go away a little bit so this even in within this soft spot you can change your portal depending on what is your diagnosis based on the mri so a little fine tuning is required even when you make your entrolateral portal but for a beginner when you inflate the knee you put a water from there and you see a soft spot just go in the center of it that's a very standard portal more often than not it will work for you and then second portal which is entromedial portal and people ask me what is the site of anterior medial portal my answer is there is no site so once you put your entrolateral portal you have seen your pathology then this portal is a working portal it is to be made where your instrument need to go which means there is no fixed landmark you put in a needle and decide where you are going to make that portal so there is no fixed anterior medial portal it depends on what you find inside and can you achieve and reach there with this portal and the needle is your best buddy superolateral and superomedial if you draw lines parallel to the petla like this like that and then if you put your finger on the top border of the petla that's where they're a little bit away from the petla if you make them too close to the petla very difficult to enter the joint so they are one thumb lateral more or less and one thumb superior to the respective you know uh, petla borders or the poles you can say so they are a little bit away that's the trick if you make it too close you struggle you can't enter so these are the standard anterior portals which are primary portals most used in most of the things superolateral superomedial then we come to posteromedial portal now posteromedial portal again there is no landmark so once you see from anterolateral you bring your light here you can see the light and more often than not it is more more behind than in the front mostly if we are a beginner we are a little bit scared about going there because we know there are neurovascular bundle there but more often than not you cannot make an entry here you have to make it far away only catch is that when you are seeing from anterolateral portal 
you enter your needle far away but you know show the needle forward do not parallel to the knee but more towards looking towards the front then you will be safe you will not injure the neurovascular bundle if you go straight down you can injure the neurovascular bundle if you go in that direction you can definitely injure but when you put your needle from far away not close but pointing and directly you will be able to make a safe posterior medial portal and i told you about the posterior lateral once i make posterior medial i put a switching stick and I, the switching stick comes out wherever very close to my condyle and then i put a cannula on top of it and from there i work posterior medial posterior lateral so these are and sometimes rarely you have to do transportal portal this is very good particularly if you are not very experienced so from one hand you have put a scope from other hand you are passing instrument but you are not able to for example hold a bucket handle you every time you want to cut a bucket handle it displaces and is very frustrating uh, in the beginning and even later so what you do is you make a transportal transpatellar portal make a vertical cut dilate it with the artery forceps and put a grasper from here you put a grasper from here catch the meniscus flap and then cut from the medial portal so sometimes you have to do right like you know you are like you're doing open surgery with one hand you are holding it with one hand you are cutting it and the scope is on the anterolateral portal so you can don't shy away from making more portals if you are struggling i think one inhibition beginners have is they just keep struggling and it doesn't come to them that something is wrong and they have to do something else for example make another portal or maybe go from another portal maybe come from the medial side and work from the see from the medial side go from the lateral side with instrument so those thoughts if you are struggling take a deep breath and ask yourself what can i do to make my life better and these are some of the tricks for example if you have lesion behind the patella or somewhere in the anterolateral compartment on the mri a small synovioma synovial tissue or some loose body here then if you try to do it from here you will not be able to do it it is just behind your it hiding behind your scope so that case you make a start with a supero mid patellar portal which will look at this part of the uh, joint behind the patellar tendon from a distance and then you can see everything very well so these are some supplementary portal depending on where your lesion is if the lesion is behind the patellar tendon then these two portals come very handy for example you are fixing acl avulsion these portals are handy so these are supplementary portal not used much but sometimes and then what are the other portals x y z anywhere so as long as you know you're not damaging your patellar tendon you know you're not damaging your cordyceps tendon please make as many portals as you like and i will tell you i'll tell all my juniors if you can do a surgery with two portals initially must make three portals make your life come learn to make more portals learn to become bolder and that will make your that will take away the inhibition of not making portals make two three four portals it doesn't matter you should find which portal is helping you to take the instrument where you want to take it take a needle make one portal you made a portal you are struggling take a needle again make another portal so make multiple portals and it doesn't matter where you make them as long as you don't damage the tendon as you don't damage the cordyceps and you don't end up entering into the condyles obviously you can't do this so there are multiple portals you can make to make your life easy if you are struggling so how about a typical diagnostic so before you even look at the monitor once you put your scope inside you put your camera look where the camera is seeing you have to hold the camera properly most cameras have the top portion which you should know it is facing the roof or they have a cable which is going down it must go down if you are not holding the camera properly and the whole thing is twisted inside you will lose your orientation similarly where your cable is pointing if your cable is pointing that way you will see perfect if some of the cable has got rotated and you have lost it you are, you are trying to look at the monitor and the table has moved cable has moved or the camera has moved you will find it very difficult to orient yourself so whenever you are looking inside and you can't make out what you are looking at come back to your camera check that your camera is looking properly that means this part is on the top look at your cable where is it looking it should be looking this way and if that is okay immediately you will be able to identify the structure inside as it should be so i think law more often than not we lose orientation because camera moves here and there and the cable moves here and there and inside everything is upside down 
So that is what the cable and the camera, and you can move the cable. Initially, it should be only in this, uh, this place. And obviously, this is flexible uh, IV uh, fluids. And then immediately, you will look at that area. Now you're oriented. If you lose your orientation, look at your camera, look at, look at your cable, you will find exactly the way you will look at it from if you open up the knee. So I, a routine diagnostic arthroscopy, I start from middle meniscus, look at the posterior horn. This is a blind area for the time being, but I can always do a velcro stretch, a stress and look at this also. And then I follow this roundness of the, of the middle condyle, and then I follow the notch. You know, our big enemy is sitting there, which is a uh, fat pad. If you follow the notch, you cheat the fat pad, you come on the lateral side like this. If you go straight from medial to lateral, you will end up in the fat pad and you will be lost and there'll be too much confusion. So always follow the notch like this. And you know, the fat pad it has the 12 o'clock position. You go above that and come to the lateral compartment. So I've come to the lateral compartment now. Once I come there, I park my scope in this gutter because now I'm going to give a very stress. As soon as I give a very stress, I can just start seeing the lateral meniscus there and the lateral condyle. Because you will move, if you don't keep your scope in the gutter, everything will move and you will lose your orientation. Then you go above on the lateral side, lateral compartment, lateral uh, gutter, you go down, popliteus tendon, you can see sometimes. Here, this is the popliteus tendon. Go down as much as you can see the posterior lateral compartment. This is the condyle, posterior condyle, tibia, and this is the popliteus tunnel, and that is behind the uh, lat uh, lateral meniscus and come back from the lateral gutter, move superior part of the lateral gutter, then you jump on to the petalofemoral compartment. Suprapetalar pouch, that's a plica, suprapetalar plica, and then you can turn your cable up to see the petla, turn it down, and then go to the medial compartment. So take a round. So start from medial meniscus, go back to medial meniscus. So make a routine all the time so that you don't miss anything. So now some tips. So when you enter your cannula, it should be freely moving inside. If you can't move, so don't put your scope because if you put your scope and then try to move, you can damage your scope. So once you have put the cannula with trocar, move it inside like this. So I've entered it. Normally I go straight to the medial compartment. I don't go super petalous. Extend the knee. And if I can move this everywhere, that means I can do a good diagnostic arthroscopy. If I can't move it like this and I put my scope inside Stop. and I try to move it, I will damage my scope. So if you have not been able to do this, that means there is something wrong with your portal or there is something wrong with the patient. For example, in an osteoarthritis, the patient may have a big osteophyte in the petula that will not be allowing you to move or the patient may have a flexion deformity and petula femur is sitting on top of each other and you cannot move up. So in a normal case, in a normal standard arthroscopy, you should be, as a beginner, able to move your cannula like this everywhere and then only put your scope in. Otherwise, if your cannula sheath cannot go where you want to see, how will you see? And once you have, when your scope is in and you're struggling and you're forcing things, you might actually end up damaging your scope. So do not hesitate to switch portal. So very often, I've seen beginners have this tendency, once the scope goes in, they are struggling, they can't see things, but they are scared in the sense, if I take out the scope, it may not go again. And they try to you know, play with it. So you have to get out of that hesitation. You should be able to bring it out, go in again, see it from lateral side, see it from medial side, get that in, in your you know, genes, in your DNA, that I will be very free to change my portal. And I would say rather, if you are comfortable, change it unnecessarily. Make another portal, just see it from there, just to get the out of your inhibition. Now, triangulation is a trick, which is a very common word. And how do you bring your instruments in front of the scope? Now, the mistake commonly happens here is you put your scope and you put your instrument from the other side and you start looking at the monitor. Don't look at the monitor because monitor will only show you something if you are doing it the right way. So I tell them, don't look at the monitor, look at your instruments physically, whether they are pointing in one direction from outside. I, I call it outside triangulation. If you can see your scope and your instrument are actually making a triangle, then only you will be able to see it on the camera, on, on the monitor. Otherwise, you will not be able to see. What happens is you are seeing there, 
and then you're playing with your hand and you can't see the instrument because actually they're not pointing to each other. So whenever you cannot see your instrument, just don't look at the monitor, look at outside and you'll find outside is clearly haywire. Your instrument is pointing that way and your camera is pointing this way and you can never see it. So for triangulation, some tips. You start from familiar place, places, for example, suprapetal pouch, for example, notch. These are familiar places. When you start moving, the knee moves, your scope moves, your camera moves, your cable moves, and you may lose orientation. Whenever you lose your orientation, come back to your familiar place. There is a, there is a place you understand, okay, now I am in notch. So now I start moving again. So you must identify your familiar place, which you understand. Then there's a technique called feel the instrument and scope. Sometimes there's a lot of synovitis, a lot of fat pad. You actually can't see your instrument, but you can feel your instrument. So that is the way. If you have a scope there and you can't see your instrument, touch the instrument to the scope. You can touch it. That is a feel thing. And then gradually move towards the hand. And suddenly you'll find you can see the scope. You can see the instrument. And for example, a shaver. Sometimes there's so much synovitis, so much fat pad, you can't see anything. For example, in a subacumal prosectomy, sometimes you can't see anything. So bring your shaver, touch it to the scope, bring it slowly. And as soon as you see it there, you know you're there. And then with a the window open, do a little bit of a synovectomy, and then things will start opening up. Right in the beginning, sometimes it's very difficult to bring your instrument, though from outside they're looking good. It's a nice triangulation but you cannot see it inside because there's so much of synovitis. So touch the scope, move, 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 move like this. And suddenly you'll find the instrument is visible. And if it is a shaver, clean up a little bit and that will make things. So look from outside. Whenever you lose a track of instrument, see from outside, are you making a triangle? If you're not making a triangle, you can never see it. And our enemies are fat pad for visualization, triangulation, bleeding, plica, osteophytes, and sometimes bony growths. So sometimes in spite of your best effort, you cannot triangulate because these things bother you. And there are ways to tackle them one by one. So maybe I'll come to those issues. Now, another big issue with a beginner is inflation. And they don't realize that you cannot see anything inside unless there's a reasonable water pressure inside. So for example, my early, maybe first 20 arthroscopy, I used to use a usual IV set. It never gives rise to that kind of a flow. It is only much later I realized I started using TUR set. Those days you used to have only 500 ml of saline. How much inflation will it give? And then we came with three liter saline. Then we realized we can raise it higher up. No high IV stands were available. So you know those ways they like we have learned the hard way of understanding that inflation is required. Without inflation you cannot do arthroscopy. So we start using TUR set and of course today everybody knows TUR set is good because it gives you a good flow. You raise your three liter bottle because they have a pressure of themselves. You raise them up, they'll give you a good pressure. Uh, you can increase flow by various methods. You can use a BP cuff, not only a three liter bottle, but maybe if you're using a one liter bottle and you can elevate it further, further. You can tie a hook on the roof of your OT, OT and just raise it there. You can ask somebody to stand on a uh, stand and then raise it. So as you raise it, you'll get more inflation. Uh, you can use a outflow cannula if it is too dirty inside and wash it out. So proper inflation is very important in arthroscopic surgery, also in knee and also in the shoulder because if bleeding starts happening, you have to have a quick wash. And if it is all very slow and it takes you half an hour to clean up everything, you lose your patience. So I think a good inflation is very important. And one Jugar technology that I do is this. There are two bottles. I have a, I have a you know, TUR set going from both. And that TUR set goes to my, my scope and the cannula there. And if I'm, because I don't want them to change in between the water is over, so I put two together. Then I have another TUR set here. Both of them are there and then I have a, you know, this pump. So in between, if I want a fast, fast inflow, I tell my assistant to, you know, push it a few times and then quickly a lot of fluid goes and my job is done. So even with, you know, three liter bottle high up, sometimes it is too muddy, too much blood and you want to get 
quickly going, this works. They just wash it out a few times, flow increases. Of course, now we use pump, but this is one method you can use. If you are if there's too much blood, too much dirt inside, and you are struggling to see, you cannot see things properly, just use this to inflate. Now, where do you make the second portal and how? So my mess, second portal, as I have told you already, there's no fixed spot. It all depends on what you find inside. And that's how you make the second portal. So I think my message from this technique lecture is examination and anesthesia is very important. Gentle insertion and systematic examination go from one end to another end every time, every time, so that you don't miss anything. Judicious second portal based on your needle technique. Your needle must go there and then your, everything will go there. Probing is very important because whatever looks torn may not be torn. Whatever doesn't look torn may be torn. And look form at least two portals. In a lot of doubtful situation, minimum two portal. If you're not sure what is happening, before you come out and say, I didn't find anything, you must look from two portal. You must make posterior medial, posterior lateral. In, in, in occasional case where you're not able to find anything very, very clear. Maneuvering of the scope and manipulating the knee is some tricks which help you in seeing more and more inside the knee. So I think these are the gentle tricks that can make your life easy uh, when you're doing diagnostic arthroscopy and arthroscopic surgery. I think that is uh, done with this part of the talk. Uh, yeah. I, there are questions that we're already, we're already one hour, 15 minutes. If you want next one, so maybe we can some time else. Hmm. Some other time, <laughs> but we can have some questions because some questions yeah. have been typed in and obviously people would ask. Uh, Dr. Course, Mugesh Chug has asked, sir, how do you deal with water coming out from multiple portals, leakage of water? If you do, you said you make multiple portals. So how yeah, do you... So in, in knee arthroscopy, no problem. Even if it comes out, you are just pumping it in. It doesn't matter because you are working under two nikke. So there's no bleeding, nothing. And usually it doesn't. It's very often if you make four portal, it will come out one, maybe two. Sometimes it's just the soft tissue blocks it. That's why if you're working in the posterior part of the knee, just finish that first because you need inflation there. But anterior part of the knee is not a problem. Even if water comes out, it's just a nuisance. That's all. If you are very particular, you can always use cannula. These days we have shoulder cannulas. If water is coming out, you can put a cannula with a block and that can stop water flow. But in knee, normally we just accept it. Uh, the question is, how often would you do pike rusting just to see the posterior medial area of the knee? Uh, yeah, so not just to see, but definitely in meniscus surgery, uh, which my partner, Dr. Vikram does, I've, I've never done pike rusting myself, but he does almost always a middle meniscus tear, bucket handle, and I was quite initially very apprehensive, but then I see him opening up, it does so well, it looks so well, and no side effect. So basically for meniscectomy, where it is a very tight knee, there is no harm in doing pike rusting, there's no point damaging the cartilage which you are actually trying to save by doing meniscus surgery, and you'll end up actually damaging the cartilage, trying to repair the meniscus. There's no point. It is better to do pie crusting, open it up nicely, and it doesn't do any harm. It was intimidating initially, but I think yeah. it is now a very standard technique. So if you can't see the meniscus, you can't do meniscectomy properly, there's no harm in doing pie crusting. And of course, in meniscal repair, it is a more or less accepted uh, technique. Uh, sir, Tejas has a question. Tejas, yes. Yes, sir. I have two, three questions. First question is uh, how to tackle the loose tourniquet in very obese patient as uh, I have encountered in two, three patients which are very obese and the tourniquet cannot be properly fitted and comes lower again and again. Mm -hmm. My uh, second question is... Uh, Sometimes when post-operative period, people are uh, told that the pain at the portal side and uh, I usually encountered that uh, the pain at the portal side are in the patients in whom I did a extensive fat pad release or fat pad uh, excision. So it is correlated with that or anything? So your first question, fat patient, yes. Fat, short females, if you're using a tourniquet, be very careful that you are there when they're putting it has to be very, very high. Sometimes they have conical thighs and you have to actually use some kind of a leukoplast to keep it there, okay? And uh, so these are the two tricks. One, be there so that it is as high. You pull, pull all the fat downwards. So when you're putting the tourniquet, pull the fat downwards and then they apply the tourniquet. 
now the fed will actually push the tunica up if not then you use a uh, some kind of a uh, you know dinoplast or something to keep it there and then then only otherwise very often if you have not taken this precaution and they have draped the knee you'll find the tunica is right and at the upper border of the patella and nowadays quite often in fact almost 50 or to 70% times we have stopped using tunica for knee surgery also because after having done shoulder surgery where there is no tunica i have realized that all this bleeding happens for a while and after that it stops it stops in shoulder it has to stop in knee also so and and also we use pump very often so it takes a little while to clean up everything but lot and lot we are doing lot and lot knee surgery now without tunica so even if your tunica doesn't work it go flat don't worry wait for a while people do lot of shoulder surgery without tunica you can do knee surgery also without tunica it's a question of waiting for a while and all the blood passes out have a good flow system so not not to worry not to get upset if your tunica is not working or it is kind of you know opened up in between very often that happens in our kind of setups where somebody has not tied the tunica properly and in the middle of the operation it is bleeding don't worry just wait for a while wash it out you can do arthroscopy of the knee even without the tunica now your second question was portal pain i think that i don't think that comes from removal of the fat pad which you have to remove as little as possible but you have to remove if you have to see but it comes more often than not by re repeatedly entering the joint so often i say when you are put in put in an instrument do whatever you can do with that instrument and then only bring another instrument what we do is we put a you know we put a grasper then we put a shaver then we put a grasper again we put a cutter again so do whatever job possible in whichever area of the knee particularly when you are doing acl you introduce instrument multiple times so do use one instrument as much as you can and don't avoid to put repeatedly instrument inside the knee and that causes damage to that area which is more and you'll always see this pain is on the medial portal not on the lateral portal so there is a scope sitting there only once for all so this is usually the working portal which you are, and if you are thinking in a particular surgery you will introduce instruments again and again for example meniscus suture it is a good idea to put a put a cannula even there so a lot of knee surgery now when we do where a lot of things are required it is a good idea to use shoulder techniques put a cannula you know passport cannula which works very well make your life very simple so i think the reason for pain is repeatedly entering damaging because every time you enter you don't go smoothly inside sometimes you hit the capsule you force yourself so you cause a lot of damage at the portal side and that causes pain often rarely i would say one of the cuticular nerves can be damaged can cause neuroma and that kind of pain can also be there so that is my uh, take on pain from the portal side sir amol has a question and tirath has so amol you can ask and then tirath can ask uh, so i wanted to ask which position is better for the beginners the dangling uh, leg uh, position or a uh, uh, same like tkr Uh, is placed on uh, on the table i think it's a question of how you have learned it and uh, like i i you see i do it dangling position and i am quite used to it i am comfortable with it uh, my partner dr vikram does it on the tkr table i i am used to that one and and also tkr table it takes a little while to set up you know to set up the side support then you have to have the uh, foot support and sometimes these two things bother me because if i am doing a lateral meniscectomy for example i have to get the side support removed and similarly that you know big bump of foot support sometimes causes problem so i am used to it's a question of how you are used to and i think probably for a beginner doing occasional arthroscopy a dangling leg is a good good position okay yeah there you are a little bit careful about yeah. it that's just that's all sir i want to i want to ask uh, while doing a knee scopy if uh, one has encountered a bleeder and one is not having rf machine then can we use underwater cautery and how safe is that you can use underwater cautery no problem but i can tell you there is no big breeder just wait just wait for 5 10 minutes let the water flow everything settles down there is no uh, iota there nothing what can breed there unless you have gone in the back of the knee nothing will breed so i think patiently wait we have had enough bleeding in subacromial space and initially it used to be bothering but now it doesn't bother i know it stops over a period of time 
So even if you don't have cautery, even if you don't have RF, I think be patient. But you can definitely use cautery if you can see the breeder. You have a cautery, use it. There is no harm. Do you close the portals or stitch it open? Uh, the yeah. question is, come sir, do you always close the portals or stitch it, or you can leave it open? The knee arthroscopy, simple yeah. diagnostic. Arthroscopy. You can leave it open, but I close it because you know sometimes it keeps leaking. So at least my dressing becomes dirty tomorrow morning, every time dirty, and the patient becomes very restless. So I put, I, I close them because uh, I don't want any soakage later on. Though it gives yeah, a really bad scar. So if I have a young, uh, you know, cosmetically conscious girl, then there I make a horizontal incision and don't close it. But those lose cosmetically much better if you don't close them. Yeah. Otherwise, I close them because I don't want any soakage postoperatively. Okay. Yes. You can ask question, please. Sirat. Yeah. So I want to ask uh, if we want to take bite in, say, posterior horn or root, then which will be the best place to uh, take a portal? On medial side or on lateral side. So you are talking about which root? Uh, on med medial root, post I mean uh, posterior side. Okay. So whichever yeah. root, I think anterolateral portal gives you a good visualization. Now, how do you repair it? That is, for example, if you are doing a medial root repair, you can see from anterolateral side no problem. If you are doing a lateral root repair, okay. In that case, your medial will show you very well if you remove the fat pad. But only thing is, if you have made a little high lateral portal, sometimes reaching that posterior part may be difficult. And those cases, you can just make another portal. Make a needle, don't struggle. There's no harm in making just one more parallel portal, one centimeter below if you're struggling. The biggest problem is, I find people struggle, 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 and they somehow don't want to make another portal. So if you're struggling, your instruments are not reaching, Wait, just make another portal, make your life simple. So I think it all depends on when you're seeing and which instrument can reach that place properly. Sometimes you make a wrong portal by mistake. Doesn't mean you can't make another portal. So one or two cuts don't make any difference. The question is that, do you still use arthroscopic scissors or most of your work is by punches? I don't use scissors because scissors can break. So punches are good enough. Punches do all the job. You have a smaller punch and a bigger punch. No, no scissor. I've not used scissor for last almost 20 years. Because they can uh, So another question is, uh, should an initial knee arthroscopy surgeon buy an RF device? Do you recommend an RF in knee for any procedure? Mm, so I, I, I use RF quite a bit in knee also for a, for a reason. Though I know RF can cause cartilage damage, blah, blah, blah. But I because I'm, I, I, I have it because I use it in shoulder. So over a period of time, uh, I never used to use it earlier, but over a period of time, I found use of RF in a lot of things in knee also. And that makes whole thing very bloodless. For example, cyanovectomy. So after doing a cyanovectomy, which I do with a shaver, which works very fast compared to RF, then I, you know, go with the RF all over again and, you know, release the true a little bit or maybe release the pressure a little bit and I want to burn all my bleeding points so that there's no post-operative hematoma. Similarly, very often I find none of my instrument can reach meniscus where I want to reach. And then I use the RF and go there and just burn with RF and it does the job of cutter. So I think uh, if you, are, you have a good precision of using your RF, you have a small probe and you are sure that you will not damage the cartilage, there is no harm in using your RF. There's a good flow of fluid. A lot of people uh, tell me, and uh, I use in shoulder quite a lot, and a lot of my colleagues say, no, you should not. But I think if you use a little bit, you're not doing all, everything with RF, there's no cartilage issue. So um, I, I don't find any much problem. Sir, do you, uh, do you yeah, put a question? drain after a arthroscopic cyanovectomy? No, I don't use a drain. I, I, I may uh, in future aspirate, for example, I don't use a drain because I do a, as far as best possible hemostasis. Sometimes they still have swelling. So I just, under local anesthesia, aspirate after maybe four or five days in the clinic. Because if I you leave a drain, and this I've kind of got it from a urologist, if you leave a 24 hours drain, you are leaving a source of infection. It is better to remove it, one go, intermittent catheterization is better. Just go in, remove it. If it comes again, again, remove it. 
But if you leave a catheter inside, you can, you know, bacteria can go inside. So I, I avoid, I avoid using a drain after I just look. But sir, I think, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Is there is there a answer, question answered? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Any more questions? Yes, okay. Sir. Perfect. I think, sir, it is 8.30. We have spent an hour and a half. And I think that is the uh, word of experience. I mean, each and every word which you speak uh, speaks about a lot of experience which uh, uh, you have in last so many years of arthroscopy practice. And even after so many years of arthroscopy practice ourselves, uh, hearing your words uh, really are something which is... Uh, <laughs> Don't tell honestly, me sir, it, uh, yes, no Let me be very, yeah. very honest. Sir, I'm I am very, very honest and I think a lot of the people who are listening here are also pretty honest. You, your Each and every word is important and that is what uh, experience is all about. What you yes. speak is out of conviction and out of your experience. What do you say, Ranjit? Isn't it? Yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Totally I, I agree. Don't see, I don't see many... Uh, at least on this list, not many beginners. They're all experienced people. So the question, again, sir, everybody is learning and even smaller trips, like you said, about reaching from posterior medial to posterior lateral. I mean, this is what hit me. So there might be some, Tirath might have learned something more. Tejas yes. might have learned something more. Everybody yes. has no take. But everybody yeah, we has all learn. We yeah. all learn. Even today, I learned, I, I see somebody else doing arthroscopy. I see something different that he does. And Absolutely. I so, so even I, if everybody of us carry one or two points, I think that's that's the purpose of the whole seminar. And I think those who are not into discussions as well, but they were actually into the, and they are sending thank you messages. So I think, uh, sir, we should thank you as a, uh, as a well, my pleasure. teacher. Of I thought I must contribute something to a lot of such a good job you guys are doing. And uh, I appreciate And this is my, in a way, token of appreciation by getting involved in teaching on behalf of Arthroscopy Society. Thank you. Thank you, very thank you sir. Right, sir. Thank you, you have been very interactive. And this is a wonderful uh, uh, format, actually, because it allows people to ask directly question to you, uh, which they find it difficult to type until that time the presentation has gone somewhere else. And the emotion of a question does not come when you type yeah, it. The emotion comes when you speak it yourself. Yeah, so I yeah. think that is the best thing. Uh, whenever we do it next time again with you, sir, we are definitely going to keep this format because we have to be sure that the speaker is uh, comfortable with the format. So you were comfortable, rather you suggested this format. So we will fix this format with you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.